Okay. So, what qualifications and experience separate you from the other candidates running for AVC Board of Trustees? What do you see as the top three challenges facing our district? And what is your plan for tackling each one? <coughs> Well, I have the desire to work diligently to serve the community in which I live. Being that I'm a new to this community, I think that I would provide more dedication, energetic, energy, enthusiasm, and motivation. And I'm, because I'm new, I'm willing to work three times harder. I have a unique perspective of what it takes to provide quality education for student achievement and maintaining proper budget and supporting all employees. I am committed to supporting and representing the voice of the students. I don't mind letting the students tell us what to do. I plan on listening to the students and fulfilling their needs because without them there is no Antelope Valley College. I have clear visions and real goals. I am dedicated to the commitment of excellence in academics and accountability, accountability and leadership. And I can construct good arguments and I will stand by my arguments. I am very diplomatic and I'm very collaborative. I think that's what sets me aside from the candidates and that's why I would be a good board candidate. As far as um, the three top challenges that our campus face, uh, the lack of courses available to students is one. The budget all is definitely one, another. And then lack of communication between uh, the board of trustees currently and um, various committees here at the college. I plan on tackling these items seconds. by being the diplomatic person that I am and making sure that the proper protocol is followed so that we can make proper decisions and inform all committees before decisions are made on the budget. Good. Margaret, is your chance? Okay, what I feel that's that that um, puts me apart from the rest of the board. It was, I, I was part of this college for 18 and a half years. Being on the negotiating team, I understand the budget. Being within the union, I understand the needs. I've been with the students in the cashier's office. They came to us daily and they had told us their complaints, what they didn't like, what they did like. Um, and we, you have to listen to their needs in order to fulfill them and it's not just listening it's hearing and listening and hearing what they're saying everybody perceives something different and they're trying to tell you something and a lot of times you have to glean that from them as to exactly what it is that their needs are so I have listened to the students I have been at the college I understand the budget I've been in negotiations I do believe that's what sets me apart as far as the three items that I'm seeing that are issues, the top three, student needs. Yeah, you know, we do have to look at our student needs. They need classes. Um, they need technology. It's not always working in the classroom. They need to be able to have the materials for the classes that they have. They need to have a nice, clean working environment. 15 seconds. Um, the other one is staffing and also, um, oh, I'm sorry is funding the budget um, and my three goal my goals cover this basically to work with board members campus uh, leadership students and faculty to make sound decisions I think what I bring to the to the table here is the fact that I've been involved in education for the last 40 years I was elected twice to the school board in the Lancaster School District I was the founding president of the Lancaster Education Foundation that's a nonprofit group that raised money, uh, raised uh, funds and, and uh, uh, money for the arts, uh, for physical education, and for computers in the Lancaster School District. Um, now that I'm retired, uh, I've got the time to do what I've always wanted to do, and that's work with the Antelope Valley College. As far as the, the three priorities that I think we need to work on, Number one right now to me is upcoming uh, after the first of the year, and that's accreditation for the college. That's one of the most important things that we need to concentrate on because without the proper accreditation, it's hard for us to go forward and to uh, do what we need to do in this community and throughout the state. Number two, and this one might surprise you, but think about it. It won't be long, just a matter of uh, a few months 
before we're going to start thinking very seriously about having a new president here at Antelope Valley College. That's a search that we need to undertake and we need to take very seriously. Fifteen seconds. I'd like to make this, again, a community <laughs> college the way we expect it to be, and that's very important to, to make that happen, is to get the right person to lead us here at the college. <clears throat> <laughs> I think the one difference between myself and some excellent uh, opponents is I'm always thinking out of the box and I'm extremely accessible. When I was on the board the first time, you'd be surprised how many employees asked to come into my law office. I let them come in. I fit them in whenever they wanted to come in. And I listened to their concerns. And I took their concerns to the administration. I didn't just listen and do nothing. I did something each and every time. And I'm sure my record speaks for itself on supporting employees. <coughs> the three main <coughs> goals, we have two constituencies. We have to look after our employees. You take good care of your employees, they take good care of the, of the institution. The truth is we haven't taken as good a care of our employees as we should, and yet you're still doing an excellent job. That's something that has to be changed. We have to back you. We have to make sure you have the tools you need to do your job. And one of them is that we have a no layoff policy and then we back you. <clears throat> now, how do we do this when they've cut around 3,000 students or more? What do we do when there's less classes? We find ways to back you. I believe we take no layoffs, and yet there are a number of us who would volunteer time to back you up. If you enlarge computer online classes, we could do the papers. We could, we could end up doing it without pay. Or if you give us pay, we could turn the check seconds. back to you. I already know a number of, of individuals who would do this. <clears throat> the other thing, obviously, is bring money to the table. We don't have to just sit and take it. We don't have to listen to the plans of where we're going to cut next. How about where we're going to grow next? What are our long-term plans? How are we going to go out and get those funds and bring them in here? That's what each and every board member should be working on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, separating myself from the group, I think it's primarily my community involvement over the 45 years here in the Antelope Valley and also of serving 10 years and watching this, this campus grow the way it has and the pride that I have taken in it along with everyone else. The decisions that the uh, Board of Trustees has made to again to get us to this situation. And uh, we've got an awful lot to be proud of and those 10 years that I have served, I'm very proud of. As far as the three primary situations that we have to face, number one is accreditation. And without accreditation, without a successful accreditation, we don't have a college. That has to be number one, even prior to the money, or at least equal to the money. And of course, at the last time we had our accreditation reviews, we only had four recommendations, which is outstanding. And we intend to keep it that way into the future so that the credits that our students take are valid. Okay? Number two is the budget. Uh, Never in our history have we had a budget situation like we have today. Here we are looking at a $64, $65 million budget. We've got some scary things facing us in the middle of 2012. You have a possibility of a $30 million. 15 seconds. A $30 million reduction, a $72 million reduction, and those are going to be things we're really going to have to face. The only way we can do it is by preserving our reserves and not letting them go below 5%. We've got them up around 14% today, and we intend to retain that. That is our working capital. The third one is what Lou said, and that is looking for a new superintendent and some deans and, and vice presidents especially that we have to fulfill. And we have to pay the right salaries to get those people. Thank you. Okay, at this time, if any audience members still have a question card, could you please hold it up and our ushers will collect those at this time. Thank you. The next question. Antelope Valley College's relationships with the City of Palmdale and other community entities have weathered some serious storms. What are the specific ways you plan to bolster those relationships and identify needs in the community? What would you do in terms of outreach to help change those relationships from contentious to collegial? And we'll start with Margaret. The City of Palmdale helped pass Measure R. The Antelope Valley College has an obligation to the city of Palmdale. We need to find a way to bridge the gap. We need to talk to the community, find out what its needs are, see what we can do to 
keep our commitment that was made to them. And one of those ways is, is talk to the community, talk to the mayor, find out what the individuals need, find out what is the need of Palmdale, what is their expectations. I know they would like a new college, but with the money that's being, that there is being cut up in Sacramento, we're going to have to really work hard to get that. Um, and we need to because of that obligation. <coughs> in terms of out, outreach, have town councils. I mean, town hall meetings, see what their needs are. That is one way to start to at least to bridge the gap a little bit. Um, there's many, many different other ways that we can do this. But Palmdale definitely has an obligation, and that obligation needs to be met. Thank you. You know, sometimes you have to actually get political to, <laughs> to make things happen. Um, that's why Antelope Valley College, it's not Lancaster College, it's Antelope Valley College. Uh, when people ask me where I live, I, I say I live in the Antelope Valley. It's just kind of a, a, a something that I've, I've always been proud to say. I'm also proud to say that I've been endorsed by Mayor Jim Ledford for this election and by three of the uh, four council members. My feeling is that I have the contacts, the ability, and, and the friendships over there uh, to help uh, mend some of these wounds. I'd like to meet with the City of Palmdale, have this Board of Trustees meet on a regular basis with the City of Palmdale to talk about uh, the learning center that we have over there, uh, what we need to do to make that larger, what we need to do to help their students uh, become full-time students over here and, and, and solve some of the transportation issues that they brought up. These are things we need to do. I'm really not, uh, at this point, going to tell you that we can build a campus in Palmdale right away because you and I all know we don't have the money for that. That's not going to happen right now. We have the land but we don't have the ability to uh, spend the money to build a full-time campus over there. What we need to do is make seconds. this campus as friendly as possible for the students and the uh, both adult and uh, youngsters in Palmdale to come over here and work with us. Sorry. My house is in Palmdale. My law office is in Lancaster. Um, I think in some ways we're one community and we work together. Uh, the entire board, I was the only one dealing with the Measure R funds that spoke up for the city of Palmdale. As far as the hospital district, I was chairman of the board of the hospital for two years and last time I ran there, I got the only one who was endorsed by SEIU, the hospital employees. I don't have broken relationships. I believe if you come to the table with good ideas, you come to something that's a win-win solution, you get creative, you're going to bring everybody together. And that's the whole thing we have to realize. We're in a boat called the Antelope Valley together. We're going to sink or we're going to swim, but we're going to do it together. And if you face it with that idea, you're going to find people are going to follow a good idea. Thank you. Uh, as with Mr. Stultz, uh, I'm also uh, uh, on a friendly relationship with Mr. Ledford, okay? And we may disagree at times, but we do have a relationship, and, and that's been in place for many years. I'm also on the Board of Governors at the Palmdale Regional Hospital, and have been, like I said, for seven years on that. And so I am involved in there. I also live in Palmdale. So uh, most of the time we go to the restaurants in Palmdale. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. We've done great things in Palmdale already, and nothing to be ashamed of. And that is, we've got a very nice campus down there. It's now a certified campus, which is one of the few in the state of California. We have over 2,000 students down there. A student in Palmdale now doesn't even have to come to Lancaster. They can get their full two-year associate degree by attending the classes that we offer in Palmdale. We're also expanding, I believe, to another floor in the building down there. We have spent $5 million on the land down there. We have every intention of opening up a campus down there, provided the money is available and we go through the hoops that we have to go through with the state of California to put a campus down there. We are committed to it. I am committed to it. That's it. Thank you. I plan to boister the relationships with uh, Palmdale, Lancaster, but I, I, I strongly believe in communication. Communication is key. Um, working diligently with all the constituency groups, 
um, as far as outreach, reaching out to small businesses, larger corporations, um, maintaining the partnerships with those businesses and larger corporations. I also agree with a few of my constituents, I'm sorry, I agree with a few of my opponents here today. Um, town hall meetings is definitely a way to uh, get the communication going and get the outreach um, going it's as far as fulfilling the needs of uh, the Antelope Valley. Um, with the population expecting to grow a half a million by 2020 here in the Antelope Valley, especially in Palmdale, I too agree that um, it is critical that we set approvals for completing the campus in Palmdale. I recently talked to Mayor Letford and that was his question to me. And I told him I have every plan on building that campus in Palmdale and making sure that it fulfills the needs of the students in Palmdale or in Antelope, Antelope Valley. Thank you. Okay, Lou, we will start with you. It is no secret that items like support for Department of Corrections are at the top of the agenda of our elected officials. School board members face a difficult task as they attempt to move education, specifically community colleges, to the top of the priority list with these officials. What specific strategies would you employ to help convince our elected officials, Steve Knight and Sharon Runner, Sharon Runner that community college must be a top priority? Constant communication, for one thing. Uh, Sharon Runner just announced uh, a couple days ago that she's running for re-election, so good possibility that she'll be there another four years, and, and that's, that's a relationship that we can build on over a period of time. Uh, Steve Knight is also running for re-election next year, so that'll be another two years for him. I've worked with both Sharon and Steve um, constantly on legislation that, uh, from the federal government to the state government, and I know them both very well. My suggestion would be that the Board of Trustees and the administration at the uh, college set up quarterly meetings uh, with both Sharon and Steve to discuss what our priorities are, what kind of legislation that we're in favor of, and any legislation that we feel might need to be introduced to uh, promote public education, especially the community college. These are people we can work with, but you know we have to set time aside and, and go to them. Um, we need them to come to our campus on occasion and see what we've done here, see the improvements that you made, see this fabulous theater, for one thing. I think Steve's been here already to see it. Uh, bring them in uh, to our community uh, right here at the college so that they can work with us and partner with us on things we need for seconds. this college. <coughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> you okay? Yeah, I just have asthma. <coughs> Let's be real. Uh, first of all, this great, cat, this great theater didn't come from the state of California, per se. It came from you and me on the measure our funds off of our property taxes, not the state. And if they were so positive, our legislators helping us, we wouldn't be in the position we're in now. The answer is you have to get the state legislature to earmark so much for health care, so much for education, so much for protection, you earmark parts of the budget that they can't touch. What do you do, since our current legislatures aren't doing that? You put pressure on legislatures outside of our district. You get them to put pressure on our legislators. <coughs> you don't just say, gee, it'd be nice to talk. Talking's great. The last time the teachers stood against um, uh, at, at um, George Runner's office one time, or Sharon <coughs> office, Runner's, they didn't even come out to talk to them. If we had such great legislatures, we wouldn't be here today. We need to do something proactive. Not just say, oh, it's time for another meeting. No, it's time for action. <coughs> Jack. Uh, <clears throat> well, I worked with uh, Sharon Runner with the uh, Fair Board for a number of years, so I know her very well. Uh, with Steve Knight, uh, again, uh, yes, a couple of days ago on the golf course, we had a good discussion about the situation. I can't tell you how excited he was over his trip out here to the uh, campus to see our SOAR program. That's all he could talk about was the SOAR, which is another thing we have to be very proud of. You know, it's like when you're being asked to give to the Red Cross or given a, a, a volunteer, you're uh, being asked to donate money to something, you give to the individual. There's one other person at this podium today, besides myself, that has close working relationships with these legislators, the two of them. Okay? 
And that's terribly important because we have the inside track to these people and many times that we can sit down and really have a long discussion. We've known for years, uh, not just Sharon, but also George, the whole situation. So again, it's who you know, it's who you can work with. And like I said, there's a couple of us here that have a very close relationship with our legislators and uh, we intend to utilize that for the benefit of the college. Thank you. Marginese. Well, community colleges must be a top priority because they are the most sought source of higher education. More students come to community colleges in the beginning of their uh, career, educational career, than any other university or, um, or, or university. I believe that we need to develop partnerships with the state legislature and keep constant communication and letting them know the, in, in, in giving them and convincing them that um, that community colleges have to stay. This, they are the most affordable uh, resource for higher education, and we need to make sure that our legislatures, our state legislature, understands that. Margaret. The other night, I had the privilege of going to the California Association of um, School Boards, and at that. Um, event, it was a summit, it was a summit on education, and they invite, invited uh, Sharon Runner and Steve Knight to that uh, affair. And that is something that we need also to do, put ourselves in the forefront and tell them, ask them to come, tell them our needs. And Steve Knight did mention the SOAR program more than once. He was very impressed with it. And if we can show them what we have done then maybe they will go up to Sacramento and advocate for the community colleges. A student with an education is a student that's not going to get in trouble, hopefully. They will be able to earn a living and, and do well in life. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Over the ca uh, course of the past year, Budget cuts have added tangible stress to the relationship between the school boards and the staff and faculty on campus here at ABC. What is your plan to improve these relationships? How do you suggest to put the pieces of this fractured relationship back in working order? And we'll start with Mr. Fox. <coughs> One CEO I knew invited people to email him. He answered 200 emails every morning. I think we have to set it up where the regular constituency, the, the faculty, the classified, have immediate access to your board members and get a response, and to your administration. <coughs> One thing we need to do is up morale by taking a no, no hot firing, no layoff policy. That will ease everybody. We don't uh, lay 40-some uh, classified off and say, oh, by the way, uh, we, we realized we could, the money came someplace else. That destroys morale. That hurts jobs. Then they give them back less of the jobs than they have. The other problem is, is when the administration needs to be more uh, transparent on what it's doing. If you know what's happening and there's a problem, you're going to work with your board, you're going to work with your administration if you're given the truth and you're given all the information. One of the ways we gain trust is we earn it. We earn it with you by showing you what's really happening. That's how we repair the fracture. We become partners in what we're doing. Okay. Um, after 10 years of watching, listening, and learning the business of the Antelope Valley College, I've come to the conclusion that one of the most beneficial programs that I'm willing to work toward, and I haven't always been in the past, and that is the integrated or interest-based bargaining. The time has come to eliminate this annual bickering and the us and them mentality, which is not properly serving the legitimate needs of the students. Faculty, classified employees, administration, trustees, community at large, are not being properly served by the way that we go about this. It is unconscionable for the minutes, hours, days, weeks, and months that we have spent bargaining on fixed positions, dealing with personalities instead of issues, when we should be discussing the needs, desires, concerns, and fears that are important to all parties. Dealing with shared governance is the educational system and specifically the structure of Antelope Valley College that we operate under. My opinion is that shared governance is not just committee consensus of administration's ideas and policies. I realize at times that policy decisions have been lacking uh, sufficient input from all the players that, and that could be improved upon. 
Properly managed, it is a fragile balance between the faculty, the staff, the students, and the administration accountability. It seconds. should be remembered, however, that the legal authority ends up with the board. That being the case, it would be very helpful if the various players in shared governance do everything within their power to communicate their specific thoughts directly to the board at times so that we get the straight dope. Thank you. Marjorie. We need to make sure that we maintain a partnership between the board of trustees and all committees involved at Antelope Valley College. This is done through open communication and making sure that there is a transparent understanding of protocol. A lot of times decisions are being made from the board that committees are not aware of. And that has, call, that has caused some static. But through res mutual respect and, um, and um, under mutual respect and morale, we definitely need to work together and improve in that as far as opening up the communications and making sure that all committees are involved in the decision making process. I just think that we just need to keep clear, clear expectations and, and you know, communicate and make sure no one feels slighted as far as the committees and the administration, board of trustee, faculty and staff and students. Thank you. <clears throat> Margaret? Pardon. This one I can really speak to. After negotiating for nine years, and I'm still negotiating with the classified, we have done the IBNB, the interest-based bargaining, where everybody puts their interest on the table, and hopefully you come to decision. But you need transparency to do that. You need the numbers to be the same day after day that you come back. Or if they are different, that someone can tell you why those numbers are different. You need communication. And the foundation, and you need to build a foundation. And I see that a foundation is built on trust, integrity, truth, and again, communication. And again, it's the hearing and the listening. The, the, and we need decisions that are made across the board fairly and equitably. And we see that some constituency groups were not touched at all, as I mentioned before. And that, again, starts animosity between the different factions and different groups. Uh, everybody is hurting. The community, the family of the Antelope Valley College is hurting. And we need its time for the healing to put this community <coughs> back together so that we aren't fighting among each other and we're doing what's needed seconds. to because we need to educate students. Students are why we're here. Yes, they need us, but we need them. That, that is why we are here. We are here to educate students. Thank you. You know, budget cuts are a fact of life and it's unfortunate. Layoffs are also a fact of life. And as a former board member, it used to break my heart whenever we had to make announcements for layoffs or we had to cut services or we had to cut uh, anything that had to do with any of our employees, the faculty and the staff of the school districts. The problem at, at this particular college, as I see it right now, is that there's a kind of a little warring faction that, that keeps going on between the, the different groups. Um, I think Jack put it very well, what he said, about what the responsibilities were and what needs to be done. I really think that uh, communication, obviously, is the key. And I think the board, all five members of the board, uh, need to be in constant communication with the faculty at any time and be available to communicate with the faculty. I plan to do that. Uh, my home phone number will be given to anybody that wants it, and I'd be happy to meet with uh, uh, faculty members of, of any group uh, at any time. Uh, Communication is important. Uh, there's so much stress that goes on uh, at a college like this when you have these types of situations where uh, people are having to worry about being laid off or having services cut. Uh, it's a terrible situation, unfortunately, like I said. You have seconds. to deal with it the best you can because it does happen. We are governed and funded by the state of California. What a shame. Thank you. Jack, we'll, we'll begin with you on this particular question. In the past two years, there has been limited dissension or disagreement amongst the five board members and or between the board and the administration. In the outside world, five strong-minded people rarely agree about everything. How will you negotiate and express disagreement <coughs> with the district and other board members? 
Well, I would say it, uh, it would be a misnomer to say that we don't have disagreements about our decisions. And I've heard the word rubber stamp occasionally coming from people, and a rubber stamp would imply that you just rubber stamp it, you to give it no thought. Well, perhaps the fact that you've seen a number of three to two decisions also illustrates the fact that we do not rubber stamp anything. And I would say each one of us give a lot of thought to each one of the decisions that have to be made. Uh, so we don't agree on everything any way, shape, or form. Sometimes what is right is right. And it's only a matter of a few items that really cause dissension and perhaps uh, a little more heated discussion at times, which we have. You don't always see it on the board floor, but we do have it. And as far as negotiation, I think I've already said that I intend to uh, pursue uh, for the next four years uh, the interest-based bargaining and get down to it and you have to say clean up our act on this situation of wasting all the time we do in this uh, going back and forth with the negotiation. That's it. Marjorie's. Okay. As a board member, one of your main responsibilities are to be a great listener. And I plan to do that. I plan to listen to the needs and the concerns of all the constituency groups on the college campus. I will always use humbleness as I listen to the difference of opinions across the board. I will always use my diplomacy skills. I will always do what's right. Even though we might disagree, we need to move on. We need to agree to disagree and move on and get the job done instead of wasting time negotiating. Yes. You're right. Rarely do five individuals, strong-minded individuals, agree. But if they get the, the right information, the information that is pertinent and from the different groups, um, whether it's classified, faculty, students, uh, but if we go out and find and research and come back with that information. Rarely have I found that a board member has come back and asked the constituents groups uh, how they feel on something other than in the board meeting. Once in a while they do, but the whole time I was president, I not once did I have a board member come talk to me. But I do believe if the, it's easier to come to an agreement if everybody puts their needs on the table and then those five individuals can negotiate and come up with agreement. If they have to disagree to disagree, that's okay. But the, the main thing is they need to talk among themselves, they need to listen, and they need to listen to the other groups that are out there as well. Um, it, it's, it gets real hard when nobody's listening and everybody's talking. Thank you. You know, there's a, a lot to be said about a five-member board. It can be very interesting at times, and I'm sure Steve and Jack will agree that uh, uh, being a member of the board, uh, you're not always in agreement in any discussion or in every discussion. But sometimes the best thing to do is if you're one person and you've argued your best and you've negotiated and you've talked till you're blue in the face and you still end up the one person in a 4-1 vote, the smart thing might be to do uh, is to unify that board and go ahead and, along with the majority and vote 5-0. And that happens a lot with boards. Now, if you're really passionate about it, you know, you're not going to change your vote. You're going to still be that one lone dissenter or that one person that's pushing to make it work. Boards are all different personalities. They have different goals. They have different objectives. But usually at the end, they come together for the good of the community and the good of the, whether it's an elementary school or a college. They come together and they work hard. You know, none of these people are doing this for the fun of it. They're doing it because they love what they do and they love working for the college. They'll seconds. disagree, and they'll disagree, I'm sure, <laughs> as loudly as possible. But in the end, they'll all work together. And hopefully, they're doing it for the betterment of the college. <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> my day job, and they tell you don't give up your day job. I re I'm a child advocate. I represent a lot of children in family law court. One of the jobs I have is to get two parents to agree when they're already in a position where they're polarized and disagreeing. So if you think I don't do all day long trying to find a win-win situation, that's what my job normally is. <coughs> when I'm on a board, I try the same thing. Although there are times when sometimes you have to be principled and fight for what you believe in. If an employee is being unfairly attacked, I don't care if it's four to one. I'm still going to do what I think is right and protect that employee. If a student's education is on the line and they need that access to that education, I'm not going to take no for an answer. I'm going to keep fighting until I get there. Now, I found the administration is slowly moving closer to some of my ideas. At one time, I suggested that we take a look at using some of our reserves to pay for instructors to keep that education going. I was told that might hurt accreditation. Now, when I spoke to Jackie, saying, well, maybe a third every year we might use to prop up some of the classes. Maybe my idea didn't get hit the first time around, but if we could keep pushing a right idea, eventually you can be a leader, and that idea can catch on. I also realize these are very hard times. People are concerned about their job. 15 we seconds. Relieve that concern. People are concerned about access to education. When those subjects come up, we have to put aside our differences, and we have to fight for the common education and the common good of our community. Uh, Lou mentioned something very important. That was having his, his phone number available to everybody on the campus, including the students, and have it advertised. That's terribly important. I know even at Anlo Valley Bank, uh, for all the years I was there, if you looked at any of the publications that came out about the bank, our advertising and so forth, there was the president's name and the president's phone number. And I had many phone calls. As far as the... Jack. I'm sorry? We've already gone through with this question. Oh, I'm sorry. So we I got were... something to say. Go ahead. <laughs> Hold on. It's okay. Aren't you on number six? We are going to begin right yeah. number six with Marjorie's. Oh, my apology. No problem. I appreciate that. Sorry. We, we appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question number six. How will you communicate with members of the campus community outside of the administration? How will you come to understand the needs and aspirations of the students, faculty, and staff in order to make decisions with those needs and aspirations in mind? Okay. I plan to do that. It's very simple. By keeping an open communication. Communicating with faculty, staff, and students is very relevant in order to fulfill the needs and concerns for the betterment of the college as a whole. Uh, as far as with students, I actually would like to go and talk to students and just ex have them express their concerns and make myself reachable. Uh, my email, my phone number, just make myself easily assess accessible for the students to be able to, con to connect and communicate with me, as well as the faculty members. I want to have an open communication with the faculty, the students, the administration, all of the above, my board members, my, um, the, the board members that I will be in office with. And one way I do think that we need to do um, more or better communications with the students is through um, online surveys quarterly online surveys where the students could express their needs and concerns and uh, to the college and to the board members. Margaret? The way I would communicate outside the administration is go see the students, go see the staff. I already have staff to call and say, hey, this is what's happening. What do you know that's, that's happening? How can, we, uh, how can I address this? Who should I see? Uh, so yes, be accessible to students, staff, faculty. Sometimes we have an Antelope Valley College meeting right in the middle of our street. There's four of us that all live together. I'm not together, but in the same vicinity. Uh, yeah, I've got to, my husband would prefer me to, uh, you yeah, know, anyway. Uh, <laughs> okay, now I'm flustered completely. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm retired, so I do have the time. I have the time to come on campus. As it is, I come on campus a couple times a week, a couple times a month, just depending on what's happening on campus. The students, I went to a meeting the other day. It was very informative to be there. It was interesting. Uh, 
go to some of the meetings, go to uh, the affairs that are happening within the campus uh, that's happening. There's a breakfast for the scholarship fund. It's amazing at how much you can glean from just different social. People are willing to talk, find out what's happening. Uh, it's a great way to communicate. And yes, open communication and listening is part of the problem. And uh, there's an old saying, and I never get it right, but it's, I know you have ears, seconds. I know you can hear, but are you listening? But are you hearing what I, I'm saying? It's like the kids in the circle where someone starts it, and then when it comes around to the end, it's nothing like it started. And so listening is all part of it. Thank you. Interesting, Margie. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you're not going to learn a lot by hanging around the administration and talking to them all the time because that's your job as a board member. You have to do that on a regular basis. So my idea really would be, now that I'm retired and, and I'm, I'm doing some consulting work, but I do that part-time, my idea would be to come over here on the campus on occasion and talk to the students, find out if they feel safe, find out if they feel they're getting their value uh, for what they're spending here at the college with the classes they're taking. I also want to know from the faculty, how do they feel? Are they happy? Do they like what they're doing? Do they feel safe on this campus? Is the administration providing them with everything that they need? I can do this easily every day now that I'm retired. And, uh, and I plan on doing it. It's going to be a lot of fun. I enjoy being here. The college has been part of my life for a long time. I was honored uh, in 2010 to receive the uh, uh, Public Service Award from the Yellow Valley College Foundation. And I'm very proud of that. In fact, it sits right on my desk at home. So I look out my window and I can see that B2 bomber in the parking lot. And that reminds me, one of the first things my wife told me we should do if I'm elected is trim those trees around that B2 because they're starting to block the view just a little bit. But I plan on being here quite often and I want to talk seconds. to all the faculty and the students and I plan on enjoying every bit of it. Thank you. <coughs> the first time I was elected, I'd like to thank those who thank you for voting in, in any election. The first thing I did is I asked the faculty to give me a tour without the administration of the, um, of the campus. <clears throat> I listened very detailed to each one of the different problems and went to a number of the different departments and talked directly with the faculty without the administration uh, around. I took those problems. The administration wasn't happy then. Why was I on campus alone? But I was with the faculty. And I took their problems and I confronted the administration. And maybe I didn't get all of them solved, but I got a number of them at least placed in front of the administration. The key thing is you have to listen. You listen to what your students want. When I was a student trustee representing 100,000 students, <coughs> I used to take each one of their problems, do a trustee inquiry, and then when I made the question, all of a sudden, those problems seemed to get fixed. So if you ask the questions and you make them public, a lot of things do get fixed. We're all part of the same team. We're working together, and, and that's the theory. We have to start thinking positive. We have to start thinking innovative. We have to start thinking, and I'm sure all of you are, most of you are already there, and I commend all of you for the hard work you've done. But the thing of it is, we have to work with the administration. Seconds. We have to get everybody working in one direction to open the access to education and give you the tools you need to do your job. Thank you. Jack. Now? Now it's Thank your turn. You. <clears throat> I'll change it now. Okay. Uh, I can see certain people in this audience, ex-students, union members, faculty, administration, that when I was working at the bank, which I'm now retired after 54 years, they would come into my office. I can't uh, remember all the times they'd come in there. And we'd sit there in my office for hours discussing some of these situations. And those of you out there that uh, I'm talking about, you know who I'm talking about. And that's where I got a lot of my insight into what was going on out here. So rather than just hear it from, again, the administration, I certainly got my information from the people out there that counted. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they were good discussions. They were two-way. They were private. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And now that I'm also retired, I will be able to spend more time on the campus and finding out what's going on directly since I no longer have the bank. Thank you. Thank you. The last uh, final question, and we will begin with uh, Margaret. Thank how you. Will, how will the student body of Antelope Valley College benefit 
from electing you as a board of trustee member? I think they'd benefit from my 18 years experience here. Um, also, I'm willing to work very hard. Um, also retired. And I think I will, some of my goals actually um, would benefit the students. I mean, that's what they're here for. Um, to work with other board members um, and campus leadership, st students, faculty, and staff, to make sound decisions. Sound decisions have a lot to do with the students, and they would benefit greatly from sound decisions. And contribute to the better working and learning environment with the main focus on students and their needs at Palmdale, Lancaster, and our outlying communities. We do have some outlying communities that it's very hard for them to come in to have classes, and maybe we need to look and see if we can put some satellite classes out at Little Rock High School, Rosamond High, um, and over in Acton. Um, and I'm willing, like I said before, to work hard for our students, um, and I think they would benefit greatly from my experiences. I understand them. Um, I'm not that far removed as far as I've had children. Um, and so I understand some of the things that they're going through at this time in their stages of life. Thank you. Being that I'm going to have some time, I'd like to try some new things here at the Antelope Valley College as a board member. I'd like to be as innovative as I can be. Back a, a few years ago, in fact, quite a few years ago, when I first went to work for Congressman McKeon, I struck up a, uh, an agreement with Dr. Ranish, Don Ranish, a political science instructor, long time here at the college. We were good friends. And I asked him if he could provide me with some students on a regular basis to become interns at Congressman McKeon's office to come over and learn how government works, uh, to work in the office, to do some uh, casework, to answer the phones, to talk to constituents, to work with the, the two best caseworkers, I think, that, that have ever worked uh, uh, for the House of Representatives. And we did that. Dr. Ranish provided me with students that came over and got involved in government, got involved in the community, went to meetings, uh, uh, met the congressman, went on visits with him. It was a lot of fun. And these were college students that really, really benefited from this. I'd like to increase this even more with businesses in the Antelope Valley. I'd like to start some sort of a mentor <coughs> intern program with students that can be immersed in the community and work in different businesses and work with seconds. government. I think it's a great idea, and I've uh, got the time to put that together, and I'd like to work with the administration and the faculty to make that happen. <coughs> I'm proactive. <coughs> I like results. We usually get there, and I have a track record that shows that, whether it's helping to enlarge the nursing department or <coughs> whether it's fighting to keep people jobs. By the end of the four years, I want to see job security for our employees. I want to see greater access to education for our community. I want to see new training where someone goes into school and can come out with a job, not just a, a certificate. I would like results to help our community that stimulate our community, stimulate jobs. What I want to see when we're done, what do you get? You get a better college from someone who's got, been there, has experience both as a board member, a student, and a classified individual. Thank you. Jack. Well, I believe the students will benefit from my <clears throat> being on the Board of Trustees uh, for another four years. Uh, my financial background, I think, is going to be very helpful considering the budget problems we're having and we will continue to have. Uh, you can always spend a buck once, and that's been impressed on me for a long time. Uh, my community involvement, which I intend to continue even though I am retired. Uh, in fact, it seems like I'm busier now than I was when I was retired. Uh, also, the fact that uh, I can relate, I'm beginning to relate even more to the students in the fact that I'm now taking an online course with Cal State Fullerton, and I've never, now I'm learning what a, uh, uh, a chat session is and a stream and all these kind of things. I never heard of such things. So uh, I'm going to be one of you, all right? And I enjoy it very much. And so I intend to continue my education. I'm also going into business consulting. And uh, uh, it's a second career for me. And uh, my grandchildren, my children, all graduated from this school. I have tremendous feelings for it. And uh, I'd love to be your trustee for another four years. Thank you. I think that the students will, the student body will benefit having me as a board of trustee because I am dedicated to working very hard 
to serve my community. And I know that there's a shortage of programs and courses here at Antelope Valley College. Um, we have new students and returning students who cannot get classes. And they need those classes, and they're going outside of our community to get those classes. As your board member, I will work very hard to see about getting more programs available, more 21st century technology. Computers is an issue. We have uh, 16,000 students here, only 150 computers uh, serving those students. The students need computers. Um, they need someone who understands their needs. They need someone who can relate to them. I'm also a career student. I'm currently taking a sabbatical on my doctorate. Um, I feel that <clears throat> I have that desire to work hard to serve the students, and I'm dedicated to serving the students because I'm a student myself and I can relate to student needs. I'm also involved in education because I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, and I'm currently involved in providing quality education to our youth, and I definitely understand. 15 seconds. I definitely understand what the needs are of our students so that they can excel and build their futures. I have a unique perspective on student needs, and that is my goal, is to provide them with those needs so that they can enrich their lives and build their futures. Thank you. At this point, we are going to t take questions from the audience. We have a stack of cards sitting in front of uh, Jim and I. And some of the questions are directed at specific candidates. Some of them are directed to the entire five members. What we will do is give you one minute for this session to answer each question. So, Jim? The first question is uh, for all the candidates from Nancy Bednar in Lancaster, California. Are you willing to travel to Sacramento for community college lobby days? And we'll start with Jack. I have no problem with that. <laughs> okay. Marjorie's. <laughs> I love to drive. <laughs> of course I am. I'm willing to go all the way to Sacramento and putting pressure on the state legislator, legislature in order to get the students and the faculty and the staff what they need so that we can have a successful college community. Of course I'm willing. Why not go to Washington while we're at it? Um, and usually on those lobby days, sometimes we have the students come along, and I know they have in the past taken a bus, and I think it would be a ball to sit on the bus, listen to the students, and watch them as, you know, they, uh, they start to learn, you know, the process in, in Sacramento or Washington. Uh, they can glean oodles of information there and come back with it and tell their fellow students, yes, I'd love to go, it'd be lots of fun, thanks. You know, 30 years ago as a member of another school board, I was also uh, uh, elected as a member of the Delegate Assembly for the California School Boards Association and spent a lot of time going to Sacramento lobbying for education and for, and for students. And it's, it's a successful effort, I can tell you that right now. Uh, if you do it right and if you work hard at it and if, you, if, you're, if your heart's in it, uh, you can make a big difference by going to Sacramento. It's not the easiest thing to do. It's not the most fun place to be. <laughs> But uh, you need to pin people down and tell them what we need, uh, what needs to be done, and, and we can be very successful at that, and I'd, I'd enjoy doing it. Not only should we go, but we should prepare and show that it's aligning the incentives with the legislature uh, to the benefit of each of their communities, the different items we want. We should also go with as many numbers who we can get as volunteers. So not only would I go, but I'd bring the materials and the individuals to go with me. Thank you. This uh, particular question is for both Jack and Lou. And I guess we'll begin with you, Jack. We'll go with you first. It is known that you are supported by the Republican Party. You both have a long relationship with our local le le legislators, such as Steve Knight and Sharon Runner. Why then have you not enlisted them to vote in favor of initiatives that they have routinely voted against for that relate to the college and speak, before, speak for the college? Why will you, will you commit before us to put pressure on them to support the college? I would certainly not hesitate to use whatever uh, authority we have, whatever pressure we have to try to uh, have them vote uh, 
to help the to help the college, yes, most assuredly. And that's what we said before, as far as when it comes to legislation, that we will go ahead and continue to do that. Uh, perhaps in the past it has not been done that way. I can't address that. But in the future, yes, I would. Um, you know, the easiest way to answer that is to say, you bet, I'll, uh, I'll work on that. But the truth of the matter is, uh, some people have philosophical differences even in the Republican Party. And I have differences with those two legislators when it comes to education issues. I don't always agree with their votes. And yes, I will lobby them, and I will talk to them, and, and try to convince them that uh, our point of view might be the best point of view. I'm not sure it's a Republican thing. I think sometimes it's just a personal philosophical difference. I've always been an advocate for education, regardless of what party I belong to. And I don't always agree with Sharon Runner and Steve Knight. Okay, the next question is also a general question for all the candidates from Jen Garamillo from Palmdale, California. With so many students already losing financial aid, where do you stand with the new DREAM Act? And we'll start with Marginese. The DREAM Act. I definitely would have to do more research on that. I'm not familiar with that terminology. Margaret. I also will have to come back with something on that. I've heard of the DREAM Act and they did mention it the other day at the, um, the high school board uh, when they had a uh, commitment there, an, an event. And, but at this time I'm not knowledgeable enough to speak on it. <laughs> The DREAM Act simply is the fact that uh, in the state of California, the legislators passed uh, a motion allowing uh, children of illegal immigrants to receive financial aid uh, uh, to go to colleges and universities in the state of California. Um, I have a tough time with that. I really do. It's hard enough now uh, in the education system in California, uh, as, as crowded as we are, uh, to get everybody uh, a proper education. We, to give money to children of illegal immigrants, I, I think that's difficult. I have a tough time supporting it. Um, I'm not sure it's the right decision to make. <coughs> Before you can help anybody else, you have to first put yourself in a position where you're able to do that. We're not. So I'm against it at this point in time. I think we have to get our, our students, our children, we pay with our tax dollars. Right now, we, we're losing thousands of students as it is. We've got, you know, we pay our taxes our whole life. We want to help our kids get through education. I'm not um, against helping others. I want to, that I always do my best. But I think we have to start at home, and we have to start getting our kids through college, make sure that they're okay. Each one of ours, each, each faculty, each child, each member here, when we get to that point and we've built up our country back again, we can look at that. But for right now, that's not something I'm for. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I am aware of the DREAM Act, and as Lou said, he, made it, he explained it very well. Uh, at this point, I would not be willing to uh, say yay or nay to it because it takes a lot. I'd have to use a lot more uh, research to, uh, before I'd make a decision on that. Uh, I know they're having the same situation and so forth in Texas on, on this kind of a situation, and it's going across the country. Uh, we're a very liberal state. I can see why a lot of the feeling is toward that way. Uh, we've got a tremendous population that is affected. Uh, again, that would be another one of the tough decisions that the trustees would have to uh, work on and, and come to a conclusion on. So uh, at this point, uh, I won't go left or right. Will you go straight? Never mind. <laughs> Marge Nees. Okay, I am familiar with the DREAM Act. <laughs> no. I wasn't familiar with the terminology, but um, I, I did remember hearing about this legislature. Um, I really would have to do more research on it. Um, we are a liberal state. 
Uh, I would have to look more into the pros and cons of it, but I do agree with uh, Steve that we have to help ourselves before we help others, and we're sinking. We're we're ba we're, we're just tr uh, we're barely treading above water, uh, just by educating our own citizens, um, and to educate illegal immigrants. Um, I, I definitely would have to think further into that um, into into the into that issue. Now, I do understand though that education is key to maintaining a civilized, productive uh, society. And I do understand as an educator, it is very important that everyone's educated. 15 seconds. Because if everyone's not educated, we, 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 we stand a chance to live very chaotic and with lack of morality, and there will be no productivity. Thank you. Margaret, we will give you a chance to respond. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, I also would like to do more research on this. Um, I have heard of the DREAM Act, but I haven't been in to see the legislation on exactly how it would be introduced or anything else that would go along with it. We are presently educating um, our immigrants through the, through the uh, K through 12. Uh, and yes, children need to be educated, and then they become protective, productive individuals. And everybody needs an education. Uh, and we just need to see what, what would be the ramifications. Um, California is struggling, and it is struggling in many different ways. Thank you. May I clarify something? Yes, Jeff. Uh, I, basically, yes, it's not about educating illegal uh, students or, Ill or illegal immigrants. We're doing that anyway. In fact, in public schools right now, uh, teachers and principals aren't even allowed to ask whether uh, you're a resident or whether you're an illegal immigrant. Uh, that question can't be asked. So we're, we're educating the students. That's not the problem. The problem with the DREAM Act is we now want to give away taxpayers' money uh, to help finance college education for illegal students of illegal immigrants. That's what the DREAM Act is about. We'll move on. This is a specific question for Jack Cephas, and I do not have a name on this one. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's the anonymous one? Why would you bargain with fixed interest if you are participating in interest-based bargaining? Repeat that? Why would you bargain with fixed interest if you are participating in interest-based bargaining? Then I would not be doing that. Correct? For interest-based interest <laughs> bargaining, you're not supposed to have a fixed position, an immovable object, okay? So I would not have a fixed position. I might have an opinion, but I would not have it fixed. Okay. Thank you. Another general question. In the past six weeks, have you spoken to faculty on campus? And if so, what educational matters did you speak to them with? And we'll start with Mark. Well, just the other day, I was in to talk to um, the ASO. They were having a meeting, um, and so I asked if I could come and address them, which I did. And it was very interesting to watch the students and how they were learning to do the Brown Act and conducting their meeting, um, forming questions. Um, and, and it was very interesting, and I enjoyed it. And that's something I think, as board members, uh, we need to do. Uh, so that we can interact with the students, find out what's going, what they are doing, um, and that makes us better board members. Okay. Could you repeat the first part of that question? I, I Certainly. Um, in the past six weeks, have you spoken to any faculty on campus, and if so, on what educational matters? Okay, thank you. Yes, as a matter of fact, I have. I uh, have had several uh, conversations with faculty members on campus in the past six months. Uh, six weeks also, but uh, I make it a point to come over here on occasion and just ask questions and find out uh, what people are thinking. Um, I've met with administrators, I've met with faculty members, and I've actually met with the student body president and some of the members of the student body. I make it a point to attend uh, board meetings on a regular basis, and I've done that now for the past nine or ten months. And uh, I'm trying to immerse myself in uh, the campus as much as possible so that um, if and when I get elected, uh, I've, I've got a better, broader base of knowledge 
of what I need to do and who I need to work with uh, uh, at this campus. <laughs> Lou, <clears throat> let me just uh, clarify. Can you list any specific names of faculty members of who you spoke with? There are a couple people that uh, some of the names I can I can uh, mention are Susan Knapp and a uh, uh, couple of people in vocational. I've talked to Maggie Drake quite often in vocational education. That's one of the things that's my biggest concerns is vocational education here at the college, and I spend a lot of time concerned about that. I've actually brought people over from other areas to see the vocational education project here so that they can hire people out of here. Thank you. <coughs> I spoke to faculty classified and students, but specific names. I spoke to Ralph Brax from CTA. I spoke to Larry Hales, which was one of the adjunct faculty, and a number of others. Okay. Thank you. Jack. Uh, I spent at least an hour, if not an hour and a half, with uh, Pam Ford, uh, with Classified Union, and uh, trying to explain who I am, what I am, and so forth, and why she should also vote for me. I don't know how far I got. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, I, if you can count an email as a communication, which I would, uh, I did uh, send uh, Ralph Brax a uh, get well card and so forth, not a card really, but an email, and had a discussion with him, and he reported back to me and so forth. So uh, yes, I, and of course, being on the board and so forth, I, I do talk to a lot of people, but specifically, there were two right there. Okay. Okay. Marginees. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I too have been in constant communication with uh, various faculty, staff, uh, members as well as uh, students. I've been to a few of the uh, ASO meetings where I've learned more about how the students conduct their meetings and, um, and, and, and learn more about what their needs are and their goals and their plans and um, some of the activities that they plan for the college campus. I was very excited to sit in on that. I've also talked um, to Pam Ford, the president of the classified employees, and uh, she's expressed her concerns to me regarding classified employees. I've also talked to Nancy Bednar, who uh, is part of the faculty, and um, amongst the three of those individuals, they all have been providing me education from providing me education from a different perspective, from a student perspective, education regarding the campus and its concerns, <coughs> from a student perspective to faculty perspective to classified perspective. And I plan on working on all of their concerns and resolving those issues. This question is for Lou. Mm -hmm. uh, Pamela Ford is asking you this question. If your primary goal is to serve as an AVC board member, why do you have so much support from the Republican Party and the city of Lancaster? You know, I don't think the Republican Party uh, is really relevant. This is a nonpartisan office, uh, quite frankly. But as far as support, I've, I've gone out and asked for endorsements uh, from people that I've worked with for many, many years uh, in government, uh, here in the uh, communities in the Antelope Valley. Um, if a lot of those people happen to be Republicans, that's Unfortunately, that's just the way it works, I guess. But I also have support from uh, uh, independents and Democrats and community members. You know, I've lived here an awful long time. Uh, I've met an awful lot of people. I've worked with them over the years. Uh, I have, I think, a, a, an excellent reputation working with people and uh, getting seconds. things done. And uh, I'm sorry if I have that much support and if it offends anybody, but uh, that's kind of the way it goes. And this question is for Mr. Cephas. Uh, unfortunately, it's anonymous. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting a picture here. <laughs> yes, you are. Um, why was so much Measure R money used to purchase a piano when so many other things are needed that would benefit our students? I was ready for that one. <laughs> I had a feeling you were. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when I first heard about that, I went on eBay of all things, and I, I typed in Steinway, Model D, and I got quite an education uh, of the quality of this particular instrument. Why do we want to put a thirty, a thirty thousand dollar Baldwin in here in a gorgeous facility like this when we can have the best, and that is the best? Yes, it's what 150 million, I believe it is. I was say this. 
150,000. <laughs> And I, on eBay, I found one that was built in 1880, and they were asking $135,000 for it. So I think it's got a pretty good resale situation if you did want to get rid of it, okay? Also, there's only, there are certain Steinway artists that will only play on the Model D. This will get us concerts and so forth here, or pianists in here, that no one else could do. Lancaster can't do it. Palmville can't do it. The closest D is down in Northridge. And this is also an income provider to the college because we can certainly uh, use that to our advantage in having pianists come in here and use that, machine, that uh, piano. Uh, on top of that, Time. if we had to rent a piano, probably it would take us 50 to 60 rentals and that would pay for it. Thanks, Jack. So there it is. Thank you. I'm all for it. I'm against it. You did. No, I just asked him that question. Oh, you did. Oh. Uh, this is to all members on the board. This is from Shannon Thomas. I believe Shannon's a student. <coughs> I think he is. Okay. No? No more He's Shannon? He's a former okay. student and former student former and president. Student. Thank you. All right. um, cuts to education funding is really about business of the state. But year after year, schools and students react emotionally. How would you explain to them that thinking critically and not emotionally is the better response. We will begin with Lou. Lou. Do you want me to reread that? Yeah, would you? Okay. Thank you. Cuts to education funding is really about business of the state. But year after year, schools, students, uh, schools and students react emotionally. How would you explain to the students that thinking critically and not emotionally is the better response? I'm not sure I could. Um, Emotion is a big part of, uh, of uh, any type of protest on campus about budget cuts. I think the biggest problem we have with, with trying to understand budget cuts is that someone asked me the other day, they said, if you have a shortage of classes, why can't you um, raise the money or raise the fees uh, at your college so that you can add some classes and bring in more money to put that on. And I explained to him that the college isn't allowed uh, to raise fees. The state does that. They're the only ones that can do that. The community college can't do it. I'm not sure students totally understand how it works, but I think what needs to be done maybe is have a workshop with the uh, students. Let them uh, find out how colleges are, are financed, where the money comes from. Uh, how it comes in, how it goes out. Ten seconds. Uh, maybe that's the, the critical way to do it and, uh, and to cut out the emotional part of it, just to have some sort of a workshop to get them to understand. Maybe even have a class on budget. <clears throat> Steve? <laughs> it shouldn't be logical. It's an emotional thing. Someone's going to affect your job, yep. take food out of your, your family's mouths, and stop you from getting an education. You better believe that's an emotional thing. It affects your life. And you need to let those legislatures know that if they continue to do what they're doing, they can be on the unemployment line instead of at the trough. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's an emotional thing, and they need to be responsible to the voters. Thank you, Steve. Jack? Okay. Well, I agree that the reason it is an emotional issue, and the reason for the emotion is, it isn't that there isn't money out there. It's how the money is being spent. That's really what it all comes down to. Uh, it's just like your, your own budget. It's how you want to spend your money. If you'd rather spend the money for uh, a car as opposed to a, uh, a Steinway piano, well, that's your choice, okay? And yet your spouse may not approve of that, okay? And therefore, there's where the emotion comes in. And the way to get the emotion out of this, the way to correct it, is you've got to get into the workings of a political situation, legislature, and get the uh, system changed. That's all there is to it. That's where you've got to start. And that's the way of this country. 15 seconds. Marginese. <clears throat> Providing education is a key, uh, is key to producing uh, more critical thinkers. And I also agree with Lou uh, that we could provide those students with workshops, give them, um, provide them with more education on how budget works. Because I've also been encountered with a few questions uh, regarding Measure R bonds. Students are asking me, how can they constantly be building new buildings and we can't get classes? 
but they don't understand that certain bonds and are, are for certain reasons. The Measure R bond is, is specifically for uh, upgrading and, and, and improving the in, in infrastructure of the college campus. So I would definitely try to do something seconds. to provide these students with education on the budget. And as a leader, I would encourage and try to motivate those students to march with me to Sacramento. Yes, cuts, the students get personal, I mean get upset, because it is personal. It's, they fe they're feeling it's an attack on them. And yes, if we can get the emotion out of there, explain the budget and that with them, that is very helpful. But also part of critical thinking is, okay, what can I do? What, how can I handle this? What, can, what is my alternatives? And that's part of your critical thinking. You know, let them, okay, how, how can I handle this? Sit there and, and work with them. Okay, do you have the ability to take a bus someplace to get, another, to get that class? Can you do that class online? Can you look at other schools that may have that class online? And yes, it is personal, but we need to get the students to stop focusing that it is them. Nobody's attacking them. Seconds. It's just something that's happening. Let's explain the budget and let's get them to think, what is my alternative? What can I do? Thank you. This question is for Marginese. Okay, it's from uh, S Susan Lowry. If this college board position is something you intend to do for a while, and if you have no other political goals, why do you have so much support from the local Democratic Party? Well, um, I've been developing relationships in the community. Um, and I've been developing those relationships with various Democratic clubs and other organizations. And I feel that's why I have that support. Uh, my goals are to be a board member for a very, very long time. I have a 30-year mortgage, so I'll be here for 30 years. <laughs> but I, I, I want to serve the community in which I live, and I plan on living for a long time. So that's why I am running for the board. And I have no other aspirations at this time uh, in running for any other political, I lost my words. I have no intentions at this time in running it in any other political aspect. I, I just want to serve seconds. the community and I want to be a board member. I want to be part of the college that gave me my jump start to be the leader that I am today. Thank you. This question is for everyone. It's from Chris Garcia in Lancaster. How do you see the board holding the college administrators accountable for the decisions that they have made? And we'll start with Mr. Fox. <laughs> One thing <coughs> that needs to be done in a better manner is every year you evaluate your CEO, you list what goals you have, and then at the end of the year you take a look at based on what goals he's done. I think it needs to be more than a yearly process, more like a quarterly process. <coughs> this is what we ask you to do. Have you done it? You might even put part of his salary on the line. You haven't done it, guess what? You don't get your full salary. I think we have to make each administrator accountable. Too often, when I've been on a board, I've seen rubber stamp from the past evaluations. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You have one main employee, that CEO, and you have to make him accountable. And the way you make him accountable is you benchmark everything he's gonna do, and you keep checking up on him. And there's nothing wrong with that. For what he gets paid, you have a responsibility and duty to check, it, check to make sure that he's doing the goals you set out. And that's your duty as a board member. So what we do is we, we, set, we set goals, we set limits, we set criteria, and we keep checking on them on a regular basis. And we keep reevaluating them when we have to. Thank you, Steve. Jack? Yeah. Uh, I would say that having been in the corporate world as long as I have, I've seen many different ways of, uh, of uh, deciding whether a person is doing the job and making them accountable for it. To date, I have not seen anything more involved or extensive uh, beyond what Jackie Fisher has to go through. I, I couldn't believe. And uh, this isn't just one page, it's page after page of his goals and his, what he's gonna do for this college and how he's gonna be graded. And so I would say we have a very, very good system and that also is attested to by our accreditation that also agrees that we do hold him report, report or accountable 
and responsible for his position. Thank you. Marginese. Can you repeat the question? Sure. How do you see the board holding the college administrators accountable for the decisions that they have made? Well, after um, reviewing some of the accreditation reports and uh, Dr. Fisher providing me with uh, his, his goals, um, I read those goals and I feel that as a board member, it is our duty and obligation to make sure that he goes through with the following those goals for the success of the college. Um, there, there is an, uh, I believe accreditation is done every six years. Um, but I think it needs to be done every, more often than that. And um, making sure that, you know, we're, we're governing uh, through policy, making sure he's governing through policy and we're supporting him in doing so, um, that is pretty much, I, I, I would, I would try, I, I'm sorry, I would propose that we do keep better, um, better, um, uh, I'm sorry. I propose that we just keep better track of it in, in more often. Thank you. Accountability of the administrators? Yes, I'd like to see more accountability. Being a classified employee, we've seen a lot of accountability um, upon the, the classified when they are very, they are definitely held accountable. And there are consequences to their accountability. What I'm seeing with the administrators, there is no consequences to their accountability. Yes, we look at it, we evaluate it. Uh, each administrator is evaluated uh, almost every year. I would get them from uh, different administrators that I worked with. Um, but what was the accountability for that? Um, I don't like what you're doing. Uh, I, I don't see what are the consequences to that accountability. Um, as a board member, if you tell me something and I find seconds. out that you didn't tell me the truth, you've lost all credibility, and it's going to take a long time for that credibility to be built back up. Thank you. Dr. Fisher basically has five bosses, uh, the Board of Trustees. Uh, all the other administrators have Dr. Fisher uh, as their boss. And, uh, you know, goals and objectives are an important thing for a Board of Trustee to, uh, a trustee and the entire board uh, to work with in the course of a year. A board sets policy and uh, the administrators carry that out. And I think that uh, if you are consistent in the policy making decisions that you make as a board, then you've given the administrators a fair shake uh, to have a good year. But you do need to evaluate and you do that on a regular basis. And um, it's pretty, really a pretty much of a simple process uh, as long as everybody knows their role and what they're supposed to do. Okay. Jack, could I respond? Yeah, we'll give you 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, annually, Dr. Fisher is graded and evaluated on his performance. Mm -hmm. This is not something that goes on every six years. Not only that, but I would say, <clears throat> especially with the board that we have today and the trustees that we have today, monthly he seconds. is being graded in a, in a, to a great extent. Uh, in the private session, in the closed session. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this uh, question is for everyone, and we will begin with uh, Jack, Jack, I believe. Okay. And it's from Joe Ellen McElroy from Lancaster. What, if any, green technology degrees do you see AVC offering in the future? Um, let me clarify that what, if any, green technology degrees or certifications do you see AVC offering in the future? Jack? I heard you. <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. I'm not sure. I'm really not. Sorry. Okay. Marginese. Marginese. That is definitely a concern as we approach the 21st century. And as your board member, that is one of my goals is to make sure or to propose that you know, we do offer um, green jobs because uh, that's where we're going. We're, that's where the future is going. So I definitely think that, that is, there is a need for that in our community, and I definitely will, as your board member, try to make that happen. Okay. Margaret? Yes, green is, is the future. Uh, we do need to send our students out with the technology of today. 
uh, and the future. Without that, they are behind the power curve. There will be others that will come in and take their place. In the Antelope Valley, when you look at we have wind, we have solar. Uh, I do know Saracosa is doing wind right now online. I would like to see our college come up with something that will help our students to be green and to have jobs of the future, not of the past. It's the future that we're heading for and not the past. Thank you. I'm not sure, so sure we're talking about degrees. Um, two things that I'm really interested in at Antelope Valley College, and, and, and those two things are my priority. First is quality education. Second is job opportunities. In our vocational education department, uh, I think we could push it into the 21st century by starting some vocational classes that deal with wind energy and, uh, and solar energy. Uh, we have lots of jobs available uh, in those two areas right now. We teach, uh, we teach aerospace workers how to uh, build carbon fiber uh, fabrication. We teach them how to work on power plants. Uh, we teach mechanics how to fix automobiles and, and, and run computers. I think the next step would be to get seconds. into the green energy, to the green uh, field by teaching uh, into solar and, and wind, farm, wind farm energy. Thank you. Steve, can you speak closer to the microphone? Sure. I've spent five years as an elected official on the Northwestern Resource Conservation District, and <clears throat> which gives me a little background on that. Um, in our state, uh, our area in the Yellow Valley is one of the uh, highest areas with propensity to get solar energy. I've also talked to a number of the conservancies out here that are trying to trade land to get it. That's actually the future of our area where we're going to have quite a bit of solar panels which are going to provide a great deal of energy. We do need degrees. We do need training so that they will have local jobs for individuals who can who can work and being able to understand how to put panels together, how to work on energy. I personally like the idea of the windmills. Every time you go up to Bakersfield, you look at them. I've represented a number of contractors as an attorney who um, lease seconds. land regarding those windmills. So I'm familiar for, with it, and we do need additional technology here would go straight into the job market. So I think that's an excellent direction. Okay. Thank you. Okay, this next question is for Jack. And again, it's anonymous. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the board approved cuts to faculty and classified staff and also reduce services to students. Yet when many, yet when, okay, ah, yet when the May revise demonstrated that the cuts were less than the board approved, rescinding the 8% cut for CMS administrators, why were not the faculty, students, and staff treated as fairly? I want to say that once more? Sure. The board approved cuts to faculty and classified staff and reduced services to students. Yet when the May revise came out, it demonstrated that the cuts were less than the board approved and rescinded the 8% cut for CMS and administrators. Why were not the faculty, students, and staff treated as fairly? Well, I know that we have approved a number of things that were later changed which is probably what that reverts or re relates to. <clears throat> but um, I know we had, what, 43, 45 um, classified laid off? And if that's what it relates to, because as the budget was turned, as the budget was reduced, we had to start reducing certain things, such as services and positions and so forth. And also there were some of those categorical funds that didn't come through that were cut off and when the funds are cut off, then of course we have to cut off the services uh, because there was no other, no other, no other bulge in the budget really to, to get seconds. those monies. But uh, that's the only thing I can think of. There again, we uh, we approve certain things, and then if the uh, situation is improved, then of course administration is going to take a lesser uh, axe to it. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Can I add to that, please? 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Um, what we're seeing is that the classified, the reduction that they did was only $303,000. When you're talking about a budget of 500, I mean of uh, 
$69 million, that's a drop in the bucket, seconds. especially when there is uh, the reserve funds. Um, and I think they could have been rescinded. Thank you. This uh, question is for all members, and I believe we'll be begin with Marginese. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Okay. So uh, the question comes from Scott Allen. It's uh, from Lancaster. What are your views on student workers, especially tutors, in the Learning Center? Will you ensure their funding? Would you like me to repeat that? Yes. Okay. What are your views on student workers, especially tutors in the Learning Center? Will you ensure their funding? Uh, yes, I will ensure that they're funded. I think that um, student workers are very <clears throat> viable uh, to the success of our college. I support student workers, and I think that we do need to make sure that uh, their, their, their jobs are, are funded. Thank you. Margaret? The tutors um, do a great, great service to the other students. They're there to tutor them, uh, to help them out, to make them succeed. And our idea here is for students to succeed. Um, they are an integral part of their success. If you need help and you don't have a study group that you can go to that can help you, you can always go to the Learning Center, set up for tutoring sessions, and it helps greatly. Yes, I would support their funding. Absolutely. I have no problem with that, and I would agree with what uh, Margie just said. <coughs> one time I was teaching a class, and I had one student who didn't seem to get it all together, and I turned to another student, and they drew a picture, and immediately the other student learned. Sometimes students can teach each other a little bit better than even some of us teachers. But, and, and of course, they, we, do, we give a, the additional information. So my concept is many hands do make the work light, and I think student tutors are a necessity that you can't do without. I don't know what the budget dollars are for that particular thing, but I would have to agree with Mr. Fox, for a change, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that quite often another student can get it across that perhaps the teacher does, doesn't. And uh, so I would have to say that, uh, again, looking at the budget situation, it would be something that would be very, very uh, a priority. Yes. Okay. All right, this is another general question. This is from Lysandra Mater in Palmdale. What are your future plans for the enrollment process? The last one was a nightmare. <laughs> and we'll begin with Margaret. Yeah, the enrollment process sometimes is difficult, and I know it is being looked at at this, at this time um, in the enrollment management. Who gets priority registration, who doesn't? Um, open enrollment um, is even a worse nightmare if you've ever been in the student services building. Uh, you have students in line, very large, long lines. It needs to be assessed, reevaluated. You have to admit, if anybody that was here back in the early 90s, it sure beat registration down in the gym. Um, but it needs to happen better, yes. Um, and it's, like I said, I do believe it's being looked at enrollment management. And um, yeah, it needs to be. Again, the, the role of a, a trustee is a policymaker. And I think that. Uh, uh, as a trustee, what I would do is, uh, if I were concerned about the enrollment process, and I certainly would be after what happened uh, last time, uh, I'd take it up with the uh, faculty and the administration and, and ask them to come up with a plan uh, to show the trustees that uh, we can do a much better job uh, with enrollment than what we've done in the past. That's their job to, uh, to make that work and make it happen, and uh, uh, it's the trustees' job to ask that they do that. I think with the cut classes, it's even more of a nightmare when Students can't get the class they need to graduate, and they may have to even wait a year to get that class. I mean, I've seen anything as an instructor from uh, at different schools, from round robin to, to doing it by mail. Um, I really think the people who are on the front lines, you know it best, and I think more a committee together with those of you that are handling it, coming up with constructive suggestions, is really the route we should go. Uh, I think uh, additional technology is going to help this into the future uh, with online enrollments and so forth. Uh, let's admit it, in some things we are antiquated. Uh, 
but we are going to uh, improve on that. Uh, I think that's about on the, um, there was one other, but it missed me. Uh, <coughs> I think that was it. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. As a board member, it is crucial that we create a climate for success for our students. And part of creating that climate for success is making sure that they're able to enroll smoothly into the classes that they need. We definitely need to better the technology. I think that, that that's really the answer. We need to better the technology here at this campus overall. And I think that once the development of the technology is taken care of and it's more upgraded <clears throat> in advance, there will be a better enrollment process. Thank you. This is a question to all board members. It comes from Dr. Claude Graton. In the state of Florida, the funding for community colleges is now proportional to the percentage of graduates. Within a year, the percentage increased from 18% to 43%. What is your opinion of this kind of funding? I'll start with Lou. You know, ask that again. I, I'm sorry. I no problem. didn't quite understand that. Yeah. So in the state of Florida, the funding for community colleges is now proportional to the percentage of graduates. So within one year, the, the percentage increased from 18% graduating to 43%. So obviously, their funding increased significantly the following year. What is your opinion of this type of funding system? Well, it, 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 does it sound to you like the rewarding success? Is that what it is? That's what it sounds like to me. I mean, if the graduation rate increases and the funding increases with it to the same percentage, then that's, uh, uh, that's uh, promoting success. And, and uh, uh, I have no problem with that. I think that's a great idea. <coughs> Steve? <coughs> well, there's a lot of different reasons someone goes to a community college. Some of them upgrade their skills. Some of them get training to get a job. Some of them go on to a four-year college. There's a myriad of different reasons. So I don't know. We'd have to look at our community to see if that would help or hurt us. Uh, in addition, it's not within our purview. It's the, the state's purview. But I think overall, I think we're doing a good job helping our students, um, each to their own need and each to their own ability, rather than just saying, uh, that old no child left behind or teacher can take a test to pass and the student isn't necessarily learning. I think we have to take a look at our needs and that may or may not be a way to go. Okay. Uh, it comes right back to the same old thing and that is paying a bonus, incentive pay, uh, teachers pay, same thing. The more kids graduate and so forth, up go the salaries. And that's what they're talking about here is the state will give you more money if you have more graduates. Well, if that's what they want to base it on, so be it. I don't know that that's the right way to go uh, with everything, but it's no different than incentive pay for any business. It's exactly what it is. You, uh, you will work a little harder if you get a bonus at the end if you meet certain goals. I also agree that the more success a college has as far as its gradu graduates, the more funding that it should receive. It's an incentive, and if it's going to promote productivity, then so be it. For every action, there's a reaction, and that is something we have to look at with this type of funding. Um, yes, success is good, but make sure that the quality of education does not go down because that is why we're here. We're here for the quality education, and that's what our students are looking to us for, not for just a paycheck, but for quality education. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Next one is another general question for all, and we'll start with Steve on this one. Uh, this is from Dr. Miguel Coronado, EDD, in Lancaster. Would you support a mentor program for at-risk elementary, middle, and high school students? You know, when I went to UCLA, I noticed that <clears throat> they were bringing busloads of elementary and junior high kids just to take a look to show you too can make college. And I think it was a good concept because it gave them something to look towards. 
I gave them something that you're going to make it. It's not just where you live, but here's something, here's a goal. And the answer is yes. Thank you. I believe it almost relates to our SOAR program, the same situation to where uh, we've got the high school students here on campus. And uh, again, I hate to say it, but I have to agree with Mr. Fox <laughs> that uh, it is that carrot out there. It's something that this is really neat coming out to a college. So I think it's a, a tremendous thing to use. Yes, nothing wrong with it at all. Marginee. Yes, I support, as an educator, I support uh, any mentor program that's going to help develop students and, and build their success. Okay. Yes, bringing students to the, to the college, to see the college environment, what is happening, how it, and I do know we have a somewhat between our SOAR and our outreach, and I was hearing from the um, students the other day when I was there that they were bringing some of the kids to the games and to experience and just experience with my own children yes my husband and I said you're going to college and he would say you're the doctor you're the accountant you know things like that you are going to college and to start them early and ha have them thinking that way that's great yes a mentor program would be perfect you know in, in days past uh, bringing high school kids to Anilla Valley College was a was a regular event on an annual basis and uh, I see uh, nothing but positive results coming out of that from the kids that uh, that really get excited when they get here. Um, I'll tell you, I, I've never been so impressed uh, with a program as I am with the SOAR program here at Antelope Valley College. That is a, a wonderful effort between the Antelope Valley High School District and Antelope Valley Community College, and uh, uh, the faster that grows, the better. I'm all for it. Well, we're down to our couple final questions. Um, this question is for everyone. And it's from Steve DiMarzio from Palmdale. And the question, how will you balance your budget? How will you balance ABC's budget when the first trigger is pulled? <laughs> He's talking about the first trigger. That's the $30 million in the middle of the year. Uh, we've already taken that into consideration, and that is the reason on our, our, on our budget situation with the worst case scenario, the most typical, and the best case scenario, we've taken the worst case scenario. So we should have, with our reserves of 14% at the present time, be able to handle that and that's the reason, thank goodness, we do have the kind of reserve that we have. So we should still be able to stay above our 5% reserve, even with that uh, $30 million. Of course, the whole $30 million is not ours. We only get a portion of it. Okay? That's it. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> <clears throat> I would go about handling or, you know, help assisting in handling AV's budget by uh, trying to reduce expenditures and increasing revenue. Um, my goal is to maintain the 5 to 6 percent reserve and figure out the, how we can do some cost saving, cost saving ideas to maintain a positive fiscal balance so that the college isn't taken over by the state. Another one of my goals is to use the most logical and reasonable fiscal practices. Prepare for worst case scenario and something that AV College uh, needs to work on is planning for long term instead of year to year. There needs to be a long term plan on how we're going to deal with these millions and billions of dollars of cuts that are going to be taking place in the next five, six years. It's, it's, not, it's not ending no time soon. The Strategic Budget and Planning Committee um, came up with the, um, we have somewhere around a 15 to 16 percent um, reserve and so what they've decided to do was they would take the reserve above 5% split it in half and for this year we would use half of it if needed and then the next two years we take that one-fourth and that one-fourth uh, so there is planning in place already for that 
Um, and yes, I think we've already been cut expenditures to the bare bones, but can we bring in more money? Looking at the budget, I'm seeing just $500, five, I think it was $5,000, or it was $500 in um, facility use. Um, we need to at least seconds. cover our costs, if not uh, make a little bit money um, on this beautiful facility and the others that we have. Thank you. I've been to enough board meetings and, and listened to discussions about the budget to know that uh, the college has done a good job of, of setting up three or four different scenarios uh, based on what the state's going to do. And you're working now on, on basically the worst case scenario, which gives you uh, the reserves that you need to, in case somebody pulls that trigger. And uh, I applaud you for doing it that way. I think the faculty and the administration have, have worked well together to, uh, uh, to basically set this up so that uh, it's not going to be devastating if it happens this way. <coughs> I've seen a lot of things on our budget. I've seen us take loans, which I'm not for. Um, I've suggested that we use reserves, which before I was told we couldn't do. I'm glad we're looking into it, but even that's a short-term answer, and at some point, we're going to have to pay the piper. So we really have to do long-term and keep coming up with an evolving process of additional funds. <coughs> One is my idea of American volunteerism, where individuals like myself who have teaching credentials, we can volunteer, not to replace anybody, but if you have a, an online class, we can grade the papers. If you have equipment that it requires an instructor to be there for the kids to use, we can stand in that place. I think we have to go out not only to get money, but to get more help from our community because we're in this together. I think we have to go to big business, whether it's Northrop or whether it's again at AV Hospital when I was on the board and pushed through, donating an instructor of the amount of money for Ten an instructor. Seconds. I think we have to go on a constant basis and keep looking for those additional dollars so we can keep our access open to our community. Okay, we are now uh, completed the questions. We're going to give each candidate 90 seconds to uh, give their final comments. And we will start with Marginese. Give me a second to reset the clock. Starting with me? Yes, please. Okay. And I'm going to wrap up by saying that I'm a lifelong educator. I'm an advocate of education. I believe in the American traditional values of bettering oneself through hard work and education. As a transformational leader, I have the ability to raise people's senses of purpose and motivation, levels of motivation. I'm dedicated to the students, and I plan on providing them with the resources that they need for student success. I am a loyal supporter of classified and certified employees, and I understand they too have concerns and needs that need to be addressed and resolved. I am a strong and positive leader who will work with all constituency groups to promote teamwork. Therefore, I feel that I am a viable candidate who understands the needs and concerns of the college community, and I have a unique perspective on educational leadership, which will allow me to make a difference here at Antelope Valley College. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret? In my, in my summa, sum, sorry, summation, uh, I would like you, one, to vote for me, and two, I do believe I have the qualifications. I've been in the educational environment for 30 years. Um, I have two daughters that are educated USC and Cal State. Uh, I believe in education, um, and children are our future, and I'm willing to work hard and, and do my best to be out there, either making partnerships, the wind, the uh, solar. We can, maybe we can do a partnership with somebody, again, to provide us with an instructor. Um, there is many ways, and we're going to have to think outside the box and be very creative in these times of need where we're getting cuts left and right. Um, all schools are doing it. We're all in the same boat. And we need to all look together and see if, if what are you doing, what are we doing, is it something that you're doing that we can do better or vice versa, and look outside the box and we'll come up with the, with the, um, uh, the viable solutions that we need. And please, let's look at our students and our staff and our faculty and everybody is one, one big family. Thank you. You know, 
A week or so ago, we had a Meet the Candidate night over at the Shimboli Cultural Center that was put on by the League of Women Voters. And um, Pamela Ford uh, came up to me and said, you know, we hear you're a rubber stamp for the board. I'm no rubber stamp. And I think the people that know me in this audience know very well that I'm no rubber stamp. I have political ambitions. I want to be a board member at this college, and that's it. That's my political ambition. I'm a little too old to go any further than that right now. I don't have the time, like you might have, Marginese. So I really would like to be elected to this board. I feel I've got a lot to offer. I've got some experience. <coughs> I've got some ideas. And I've got the time. I'm concerned about the graduation rate here at the college. I'm concerned about students that uh, take advantage of student aid, uh, financial aid, and then drop out after they get the money. That bothers me. I'm also concerned about the fact that we need to get into the technological uh, area much more here at the college. I'd like to see wireless connectivity so that students can use their computers out in the quads. I think that's important, and I think that's coming into the 21st seconds. century. So those are some of the things I'm concerned about. Uh, if you feel I'm the right person, please vote for me. Thank you. <coughs> I think <coughs> the administration done a, a quasi-reasonable job of being reactive to this budget crisis. The problem is, is the result of hiring freezes and not replacing people has caused, a, caused an uneven education where certain departments like business and others have been hard, hit harder than others and it's injured the education, such that some students at the Palmdale campus um, aren't necessarily from Palmdale, they're taking a class there because there are no classes at the Lancaster campus. What we have to focus on is being proactive, increasing the access, whether it's on online classes, whether it's getting people to volunteer, to be instructors, whether it's to go out and get additional funding from businesses, which I've suggested. And I'd like to put out that I have one major consistency, and one only, you, the public. And I've proved that time and time again. And if, if elected, I'm going to continue to support your desires, your wishes, and the things you want to accomplish in our community. Well, I guess I'm one-fifth of the equation that got us to where we are tonight, and that is I'm very proud of where we are tonight through our accreditation, uh, the buildings that you're now seeing on this campus, the way that it's no longer called a tumbleweed, uh, tumbleweed tech, uh, the Palmdale campus, which we're very proud of, uh, our parking situation, thank goodness, and uh, all the technology we are putting in. I, too, am looking <coughs> to the future and not the past that I came over with my computer the other day because I had to take my chat session with Cal State Fullerton and lo and behold, we don't have a web here. I thought, sure we would. So we've got a lot to do into the future. As Lou said, uh, the, uh, the web is terribly important <laughs> so these kids can use their computers. And uh, online uh, enrollment and everything else, we've got a great future ahead of us. Uh, I'm retired. I'm looking forward to spending much more time than I did in the past. But again, the past is something to be proud of. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I think everybody, could we just give our candidates just a round of applause for the time? You did well. Thank you. Appreciate it.